a boy who was never intended to be king. But a king he became. Terrible cruelty. Romantic passion. The man who came to be known as King Henry VIII would marry no fewer than six times, in pursuit of not only a male heir, but also of love. His story is so bombastic. I mean, what other monarch has six queens and beheads two of them? He is a king of which England can be proud, and there is very much celebration at his accession to the throne in 1509. But who was the man behind the myth of the king who married six times and had two of his wives beheaded? It's 1502. In Ludlow, Henry VII's eldest son and heir to the throne is gravely ill. He was the Prince of Wales, and much hope and expectation lay on his shoulders. He is the future of the dynasty. Contained within the great grey castle walls, the teenage Prince of Wales and his young wife, Catherine, suffer with the sweating sickness. The princess, miraculously, recovers. The prince does not. A rider is dispatched post-haste to relay the news of the death of Arthur, Prince of Wales, to the king, Henry VII. The king and queen grieve the loss of their beloved eldest. But for the king, there is little time to grieve. the Tudor line of succession must be secured. The royal couple have six remaining children, all daughters save one, Prince Henry. He is the second son of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. So he is declared Duke of York as a child, and he's always intended to be a great nobleman, but of course isn't raised to become king. Henry's life changed dramatically upon the death of his brother Arthur. From having been the spare, he was now the heir, and all of England's hopes rested upon his shoulders. He's declared Prince of Wales, and he now becomes the sole focus of his father's ambitions and his father's efforts, because his father has no brothers. He has no other surviving sons. So Henry VIII is the future of the Tudor dynasty. As the second son, Henry grew up surrounded by women at Eltham Palace, ever in his mother's, sister's, and aunt's company. He was a treasured prince, but never expected to be king. That was the lot of his elder brother, Prince Arthur.
But upon the death of his brother, the 11-year-old Henry's life is turned upside down. From this point onwards, the heavy burden of the succession would become his to bear. Henry VII was never a popular king. Most of his court feared him. So on his death, there is a sense of celebration, you know, of, of joy that England is now going to get this young and charismatic king. The country's golden prince, the charismatic and handsome Henry, was proclaimed King of England and Lord of Ireland. Henry VIII very much resembled his grandfather, Edward IV, who'd been very, very popular. And there is a real sense of hope for the future. He's seen as a true Renaissance prince. He's highly educated. He's incredibly good looking. The young Henry VIII was described as so beautiful, he'd make a pretty woman. He is a king of which England can be proud and there is very much celebration at his accession to the throne in 1509. A king must have a queen, and in his youth, he had been betrothed to his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon, Princess of Spain. When Henry VIII ascended to the throne, one of his first acts was to ask his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon, for her hand in marriage. However, to marry her, the new king has to gain a special dispensation from the Pope in Rome. The Pope approves this, and Henry and Catherine are wed and crowned King and Queen of England, strengthening once again England's alliance with Spain and the rest of Catholic Europe. Catherine proves herself to be a good wife and a great queen. Henry adores her, and the country follows suit. Henry is athletic and handsome. He likes to defend his manly honor in the joust. But when international tensions arise, he is not one to shy away from a real fight either. In his early reign, Henry is often at war with France. Catherine is a good queen and is appointed regent during Henry's many absences whilst on campaign in France. Catherine in many ways was an ideal queen consort. She was supportive of Henry and his many campaigns abroad, but she was also happy to be subservient to him. She was a loyal wife to Henry and also expected loyalty back. She fulfills all her duties as queen, save one, securing a male heir. For the first 10 years of her life married to Henry, Catherine spent most of it pregnant. And tragically, out of six children, only one was to survive. In 1516, after many years of sadly losing children, Catherine of Aragon gave birth to a daughter who was christened Mary. Now, it is often stated that Henry was disappointed at the birth of a daughter, but actually I think we have evidence that he was relieved that at last a child was surviving into its infancy. And while for Catherine, as the daughter of a female sovereign, the idea of a reigning queen is, is not so alien. For Henry, coming out of the Wars of the Roses, it is a terrifying prospect. With Catherine, who is six years older than Henry and nearing middle age, the king begins to worry. With only one daughter and no legitimate sons, the succession of the Tudor dynasty is not yet assured. The king must sire a legitimate son. The Tudor dynasty will not be secure until a male heir is born. 
their marriage begins to deteriorate. In 1519, Catherine has her last pregnancy. A year earlier, she had been humiliated by the birth of an illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, to one of the king's favorite mistresses, Bessie Blount. The boy was made Duke of Richmond in 1525, and many historians speculate that this was the first stop on the path to his eventual legitimization. But the king's attention now has turned to another woman at court. Her name is Anne Boleyn. Henry VIII was actually quite slow in his advances towards Anne Boleyn, who joined his court in 1522. He actually had a relationship with Anne's sister, Mary Boleyn, in the interim years before he turned his attentions towards her. But we know for certain by 1526 that Henry VIII was falling head over heels in love for Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn had always looked for a good marriage because marriage is a way towards social status for women. There is no doubt that Henry adored Anne. He loved her deeply. In his letters, he talks about being struck by the dart of love. Henry will move heaven and earth to marry Anne for love, lust, and for the male heir he so desperately craves. Having served Henry and the country as a faithful wife and queen for almost 20 years, Catherine is cruelly abandoned by her husband. He is unable to execute her as she is protected by her powerful family, including the Spanish monarchs and the Holy Roman Emperor. Henry wants a divorce. The only real way that Henry was going to be able to marry Anne was if the Pope would annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. And Anne and Henry knew that the best mechanism uh, for achieving that end would be through the King's minister, Thomas Wolsey. Henry's court is populated by men from all walks of life. Henry VII's distrust of the nobility and insecurity in his right to the crown led to him appointing many men of common birth to positions of prestige and power at court, and Henry VIII continues this legacy. One of Henry's most trusted advisors, Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, is one such man. He is the son of a butcher, elevated to the position of Lord High Chancellor of England. In the late 1520s, he is entrusted with one of the most important missions of Henry's reign thus far. He is sent to Rome to petition the Pope to grant an annulment for the marriage of Henry and Queen Catherine, so that he may be free to marry Anne Boleyn. Henry wanted to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon on the basis that she had been his brother's wife. So they're related to within the first degree of affinity. They are as far as the church is concerned, brother and sister. And his argument is that you cannot dispense such a marriage. And such a marriage cannot be permitted. It is against church law. What is quite ironic is that when he first sends to the Pope to request his annulment, his messenger also has a second request for a dispensation to allow him to marry a woman within the first degree of affinity to him. And this is because his sexual relationship with Mary Boleyn has created the same relationship between him and Anne that exists between him and Catherine of Aragon. So it's an ironic point, but I think it also demonstrates very, very clearly that his reasons for annulling the marriage to Catherine were not sincere and that actually he wanted rid of her because he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn. This becomes a matter of international tension. Catherine's nephew, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, is vehemently against the annulment, as is Queen Catherine herself. Pressure comes from all sides for Pope Clement 
as Queen Catherine and King Charles V urge him not to annul the marriage, and Wolsey and Henry push for the dispensation to be made. While the Pope is in the Emperor's power, he will never grant the annulment of the Emperor's aunt's marriage. The English try and Cardinal Wolsey tries, but he's in an impossible situation. He can never do it. He will never be able to annul this marriage. Caught between the wills of two powerful kings, the Pope delays his decision as long as possible, the indecision infuriating both Henry and Anne, who begin to doubt Wolsey's loyalty to the crown over the church. Wolsey returns to England without the Pope's annulment. Wolsey ultimately fails to secure an annulment for Henry from his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, and this leads to his dramatic fall. Having fallen out of Henry's good graces, he accuses Wolsey of treason, and the cardinal is arrested. He dies on the way to his trial. Thomas More is replaced as the Lord Chancellor. Henry knows that the Pope is not going to grant his annulment to his first queen, Catherine of Aragon. There is no solution other than breaking away from the Pope, because if the Pope will not grant the annulment, then perhaps the church needs to move from the Pope and therefore he is greatly influenced by these new thinkers, including Anne Boleyn, and taking the unprecedented step to break with the Church of Rome and to install himself as king, as the head of his new church. As soon as Thomas Cranmer is confirmed as Archbishop of Canterbury, he disavows his oath of allegiance to the Pope and declares the English church separate from Rome with the king as its supreme head. And this is the moment that the English church goes its own way. In order to do this, Henry actually elevates himself beyond kingship and proclaims that he is an emperor of his own empire. This is really the beginnings of the British Empire. This is where it all begins. Anne and Cromwell's shared reformist views make them indomitable allies. The Act of Supremacy in 1534 confirmed the break from Rome, fueled more by political affair than theological dispute. Having installed himself as the supreme head of this new Catholic Church in England, grants his own divorce and begins preparations to marry Anne Boleyn. A number of rebellions against the new Church of England have to be put down. Dissenters fare much the same. Sir Thomas More, the Lord Chancellor, is executed for refusing to acknowledge Henry as head of the church. Thomas Cromwell is appointed Vicar General and later Chancellor and will be instrumental in the coming turmoil of the Heinrichian Reformation. The Henrican Reformation really only comes about for one reason, so that Henry can annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon and marry Anne Boleyn. But it soon becomes clear to both Thomas Cromwell, his chief minister, and to the king that there are going to be many benefits of being ahead of one's own church. For example, there was great wealth in the monastic houses, the monasteries throughout the land. Although Henry had come into a great fortune courtesy of his father when he took the throne, his ruinous wars in France and his expensive and lavish lifestyle led to emptying coffers. The monasteries weren't only a reminder of the power of the Roman Catholic Church, but were also among the wealthiest institutions in the country. At the time, monasteries and abbeys owned approximately a quarter of the land in England. The miserly Thomas Cromwell proposed that the crown dissolve the monasteries 
and seize their land and estates. But Henry VIII now realized that he could profit from those exorbitantly wealthy institutions. So we begin to see a real shift in the landscape of the country. Uh, firstly, the smaller monasteries are dismantled and all of the wealth is funneled back to the crown and uh, really into the coffers of the nobility. The confiscated lands are sold to nobility, who are sympathetic to Henry's Reformation. Now, this caused great disturbance throughout the country. We have to remember that most of the country is still traditionally Catholic. They rely upon the monasteries not only for education, but also for shelter. Uh, they really act as um, almost the, the safety net of the country. And these beloved institutions are being stripped away and funneled into the coffers of the nobility and the crown. Most nuns, abbots, and monks are afforded pensions, though some refused the king and were executed for treason, their monasteries destroyed. This causes enormous tension throughout the country. There are increased rioting and also rebellions. And this leads to enormous bloodshed and tension throughout the country. Vast amounts of monastic land, gold, and silver were transferred to the crown, which were used to fund Henry's wars with Scotland and with France. In the winter of 1532, Anne and Henry journeyed to Calais to gain the approval of King Francis I of France. In a private conference with Anne, he gives them his blessing, and by the time they reach Dover on their ship, they are lovers. They wed hurriedly in secret, and again publicly two months later, and Anne is crowned queen. A few months later, Anne is pregnant. They believe it will be a son. Henry is impatient with anticipation. In September 1533, Anne goes into labor. The baby is a girl. They name her Elizabeth after Henry's mother. Elizabeth's birth was disappointing. I mean, he really did want to have a son, but he knew that both he and Anne were young enough to have more children, and Anne does quickly become pregnant again the following year. In February of the same year, Henry enters into a jousting tournament. It will be the last one he ever competes in. Henry VIII loved jousting, and it is an incredibly dangerous sport. Once in his youth, actually, he came close to being killed when he forgot to put the visor down on his helmet. And his friend, the Duke of Suffolk, um, didn't notice and jousted at him. And actually, the lance splintered. And he was very lucky to survive. Some reports state that he was unconscious, whilst others just mention the fact that he was severely injured. He fell badly and his horse landed on top of him. This really changed Henry's lifestyle. It, in many ways, emasculated him. One account suggests that he was unconscious for several hours. And there are also suggestions that perhaps there is some sort of brain damage. I think this is a turning point in Henry's life, and not for the better. He will never recover from his injuries. 
and miscarries from the shock of Henry's accident. Whilst Henry and Cromwell were intent on plundering the spoils from the monasteries and funneling the funds into their coffers, Anne had other ideas. She believed that the wealth from the monasteries should be distributed, much as the monasteries had done, to the common people by way of establishing educational facilities for the masses. The masses had relied upon the monasteries for education. So this set Cromwell and Anne against each other, and Anne actually threatened Cromwell at this point with his head. Cromwell retreated from court, and upon hearing that the king wanted out of the marriage, he returned and fired directly at Anne's head. Cromwell poisons Henry against her, and she is arrested and charged with adultery, incest, and treason. Though she is his wife, queen, and mother of his child, Henry signs her execution notice. Anne is executed on the 19th of May, 1536, by the blade of a French swordsman. Henry orders a cannon be fired at the moment of Anne's death, so he knows when it is done. This is Henry's cue to move on. The very next day, he proposes to his third queen, Jane Seymour. A fortnight later, Jane and Henry are wed. To Henry's great relief, in October 1537, a son is born whom they call Edward. After many years of heartache, Jane Seymour finally gave Henry the son and heir that he so desperately craved. Henry was elated. There was much celebration throughout the kingdom and lavish feasts and jousts were prepared. This is the moment that Henry has been waiting for for nearly 30 years. But tragically, all was not well in the birthing chamber. Jane holds on until the 24th of October, 12 days after the birth of her son, before sadly dying in the night. Henry VIII was absolutely crestfallen at the death of Jane Seymour. He really appears to have entered into a prolonged period of mourning and depression. Henry at this point had gone through a huge amount of heartache, he had gone to extraordinary lengths to secure this son and heir. And then, tragically, his wife had been snatched away from him. He really must have felt that everything was stacked against him at this point. Two years elapse, and in 1539, Henry is once more in search of a new queen. Thomas Cromwell proposes that he marry Anne of Cleves, the 25-year-old sister of the Duke of Cleves. So most kings in the period chose their wives for diplomatic reasons. They wanted to make a grand foreign alliance which would bring friendship between the countries. Henry had been unsuccessful in finding a French bride and then an imperial bride. Rather like Anne Boleyn, Thomas Cromwell was something of a religious radical and he understood that Henry's kingdom was rather less secure than it should be because of his newly founded Church of England. Therefore, Cromwell's proposal was to create an alliance with a Protestant country, and he looked abroad to Cleves. This is a great alliance for England, as Cleves is considered an important ally in the event of a Roman Catholic attack on England because the Duke fell between Lutheranism and Catholicism. Intrigued by the proposition, Henry dispatches his favorite court painter, Hans Holblein, the younger, to take her likeness. 
Portraits were often used to arrange royal marriages in Tudor times and are also a display of wealth, status, and power. Three things very dear to the king. Henry is a vain man. All his life, he has loved dressing in the latest fashions and luxurious fabrics. And his image has always been important to him. His wife's appearance is also crucial. Months later, the painter returns with a portrait of a young and healthy woman. Henry agrees to the union. The marriage contract was signed in September 1539, and Anne then made her way towards England. Henry VIII's first meeting with Anne of Cleves couldn't have gone worse. Anne was supposed to voyage to court to meet Henry, but like a lovesick boy, Henry can't wait to meet her and decides to visit her in disguise. Henry VIII arrived to find Anne of Cleves looking out of a window at a bear baiting below. Now, as part of court etiquette and as part of the language of courtly love, Henry's courtiers knew that Henry would often appear in disguise, and they in turn were supposed to recognize the king no matter what he was wearing. This was to flatter the king. Now, Anne grew up in a completely different environment to this. She wasn't conversant in the language of courtly love at all. And when Henry VIII burst into her chamber, she was completely unimpressed with this man that stood before her. Her visitor then left the room and returned wearing a purple cloak, which was a cue for everyone to recognize the king. And as they fell to their knees, Anne, of course, realized her mistake and recognized that this was Henry VIII, this was her suitor. But the damage had already been done. And I think, actually, in that moment, Henry VIII saw, perhaps for the first time in his life, a genuine reaction to how unattractive he had become. Anne hadn't recognized him as this all-powerful, majestic person. She'd simply seen an obese and slightly aging man before her. Henry would leave that chamber and proclaim, I like her not, and state that she was nothing like as was depicted in her painting. Actually, most people seem to have agreed that the portrait was a good likeness, but there was just something about Anne that didn't appeal to Henry. But I think the truth of the matter was that there was an ugly, aging and smelly person in that chamber. And it wasn't Anne of Cleves, it was Henry. Unable to get out of the marriage for fear of offending Europe, the couple marries. He had suffered from intermittent impotency since the days of his marriage to Anne Boleyn and just could not consummate the marriage. So the marriage was a disaster. They divorce as soon as an allyship with Cleves is less desirable. Anne is afforded the title the King's Sister and gifted a great portfolio of properties. Having served Henry loyally for many years, Thomas Cromwell was now seen by the king as the architect of this incredibly awkward marriage between Anne of Cleves and himself. And he really blamed Cromwell. The Duke of Norfolk, a noble of conservative views and an old rival of the reformist Cromwell, has another proposal for the king. He offers Henry the hand of his young niece, Catherine Howard, and convinces him that Cromwell no longer prioritizes the king's wishes, but his own. Despite decades of friendship and service to the king, Henry signs the execution notice. He is not even afforded a trial. On the 28th of July, 1540, Cromwell is led to the scaffold at Tower Hill, where the executioner's axe awaits him. Not far away, on the very same day, King Henry and his fifth queen, Catherine Howard, dance and feast at their wedding banquet. Catherine Howard is really Henry VIII's midlife crisis. She'd been a lady-in-waiting to Anne of Cleves. She's a teenager. 
Henry VIII is absolutely besotted by Catherine. He lavishes gifts upon her jewellery and clothes. Soon rumours start at court that all is not well with Catherine's past. She was a woman with a past, or a girl with a past, really. And she'd had two previous lovers, one of which had been consummated. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, leaves a letter for the king to find, which details some troubling facts about Catherine's past. At first, Henry VIII is entirely dismissive of these claims, but he does order that Thomas Cranmer investigate. But then things take a turn for the worse. A letter is discovered in the possession of Thomas Culpepper, one of Henry VIII's favourites at court. This is a romantic letter. It talks of Catherine longing to see him. And this sends Henry into an absolute rage. He is blinded by this rage and suggests that he is going to kill Catherine with his own sword. She is confined to her apartments and then is imprisoned at Sion Abbey. But rather unlike Anne, who is dispatched within 19 days of her arrest, Catherine languishes in prison. Henry can't quite believe what has happened. And eventually Catherine is uh, taken herself to the Tower of London. She has not been afforded a trial, but rather an act of attainder is passed against her, an act of parliament which suggested that she has wronged the king and that she is to die. She is taken to the Queen's apartments, the Tower of London, and is afforded a private execution on Tower Green. As his life accelerated towards its end, Henry becomes obese. His waist measurement is recorded to have reached 54 inches. Henry marries his sixth and final queen, Catherine Parr, in 1543. Henry VIII's sixth and final queen was Catherine Parr. Catherine was a relatively young woman when Henry first took notice of her, but actually she had already been twice widowed. She was very, very reluctant to marry Henry and actually seems to have been quite horrified when he declared his interest in her. Henry, however, would not be refused. There are claims that Catherine actually said it was better to be his mistress than his wife, but if that was the case, he ignored her and insisted on marriage. Catherine is incredibly fond of the king's daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, and indeed persuades Henry to restore the girls to the line of succession. Catherine Parr is an incredibly intelligent woman. She is very well read and has very radical religious ideas too. Catherine immediately took up her duties as queen. She seems to have felt that her queenship was ordained by God, and certainly later in the letter she wrote that God had withstood her will when she had not wanted to become, that God had required her to take on the queenship. And she seems to have felt that this was to help promote Protestantism, because Catherine is England's first Protestant queen. And I don't think Henry had a seventh wife lined up, so he, what he is trying to do is he is trying to scare Catherine back into submission. But certainly the relationship is not quite the same. And for the rest of 1546, Catherine is in quite a precarious position, aware that there are rumors that Henry may take a seventh wife. Henry VIII had been ill on and off for the latter part of 1546. And just before Christmas, he leaves the queen and his daughter Mary and goes to Westminster.
and it's clear very quickly that he's dying. He spends his last few weeks cloistered away with his counsel, and particularly his secretary, William Paget, who is very close to Edward Seymour, Henry's brother-in-law, the brother of Queen Jane, and the uncle of the heir to the throne. During this period, Henry asks that a new will is drawn up. He previously made a will in the early days of his marriage to Catherine Parr, and he seems to have named her as regent in the event of his death. But this new will completely overturned that. Instead of naming anyone as regent, Henry, in fact, established a council of equal ranking executors. So all of these men have an equal role to play. And they, it was hoped that they would guide Edward through his minority and into his adult reign. On 28 January 1547, Henry dies at age 55 at the Palace of Whitehall. His death is kept secret for three days. Henry is interred in a vault at St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle, next to his third queen, Jane Seymour. The end of one king's reign is but the beginning of another's. His son, Edward, is little more than nine years old and is now the King of England. <laughs>